Hello everyone, this is John from Coins, RPGs, and more. And tonight I have a very special recommendation that I'm going to make. And that is, I'm going to recommend, if you can, get your hands on a copy of the Prince Valiant Storytelling Game. This is the more recent hardcover that was released back in, I believe, 2018, uh, along with a companion book of uh, the Prince Valiant episode book that had a bunch of different episodes and scenarios written in it. Uh, this game, it's a bit hard to get your hands on right now. It's out of print and copies on eBay are of the older version, which I showed in a previous video. I'll show you a, cop a copy of it now. Uh, this is the previous version that was released back in the 80s. Um, this is still good. This is still something that you can use. In fact, actually, uh, rules-wise, I'm not able to detect many differences between the old version of the rules and the new version of the rules. Aside from these are, this is hardcover, it's got better art, the paper quality is better, and uh, there's it's all full color all the way through instead of being... Um, black and white on the interior and only having color on the, uh, the front cover and the back cover. Okay. This is the Prince Valiant RPG or a uh, storytelling game is written by Greg Stafford. Greg Stafford is also known for writing the Pendragon uh, role-playing game. In fact, there, anyone who's familiar with Pendragon should already know his name. I have not played Pendragon. I have no opinion on Pendragon. Uh, I can't. I want to play Pendragon, but it hasn't happened yet. So I'm not going to talk about it. But I will talk about this game. And that's why I wanted, I just want to say this. Greg Stafford, uh, judging by what I've read in this game, I want to try Pendragon because it sounds like he's got a pretty good solid stance on the rules. Uh, the Prince of Valiant storytelling game is, at its heart, a dice pool game. When you create a character, you have two main stats. You have your, your brawn and your presence. Uh, your brawn covers all the physical attributes of your character. Uh, you know, what in D&D in &D terms would be covered by strength, dexterity, and constitution. Well, they're all under brawn here. Uh, presence covers uh, presence is your character's mind their and their will their ability to uh, to mold other people to what they want or inspire others or influence others mentally or just be able to remember good facts that also falls under presence so presence is like a combination of intelligence wisdom and charisma if you want to use uh, d20 type terms but it's it's more than just those things. It, it really is it's its own concept. And what you do is you take your brawn or your presence and you get so many pips or so many uh, you know dots in for each of those. And you combine that with a skill that your character has and that and you combine that to get a total number of dots or pips. And what happens is, in order to resolve an action, you take that total number and you take that many coins and you toss those coins in the air and whatever lands on heads, that's a success. So if you toss six coins in the air and only one of them lands on a head, well, you got one success. That means you succeeded somehow in that skill, unless it was an opposed role are opposed toss against the storyteller. And so the storyteller playing the role of, you know, the, the monster in the marsh is going to toss their coins. And then you'll count how many coins uh, came up heads for them and whoever got more wins. And if it's a tie, then nobody wins. And you toss again uh, for the next round. It's basically like a stalemate if there's a combat or if it's a debate. Um, 
it i i like it as a concept i think it's it's very neat it's very tidy i'm not sure i like the idea of tossing coins at themselves necessarily but i i like the the, the dice pool idea of just having a, a a pool of whatever and basically a coin is a two-sided die you could do the same thing with a four side with a bunch of d4s if you you're like i want to toss caltrops you're covered man or lady or whatever you know i you're, you're covered uh because you can toss as many caltrops as you want one to two is is tails and and three to four is heads or, or reverse it whatever your gm and you agree on whatever the storyteller and you say is is fine is fine I like D6s. Uh, you know, one to three is uh, tails and four, five, and six is heads. Uh, and then you're just tossing dice. And it's fine uh, because basically you're saying four up is a success. Um, so that's the mechanic. That's it. it. There's nothing more complicated than that. And now there there are things that, you know, add nouns to things and then and, and tell you when you add, when do you add coins to your toss and when do you take them away and if, uh, oh, if you manage to toss your coins and every single coin comes up heads, then no matter how few coins you toss, that means that you get one additional success in that pool of successes. So if you toss five coins and all five come up heads, then you got six successes. So um, that's pretty cool. It's not an automatic win because your opponent may be tossing 14 coins and had six come up with success. So you still may lose that one. I played this out a little bit uh, in, in a solo scenario, and it kind of felt a little attrition-y to me, uh, because when you're fighting a battle, basically, however many successes you roll over what your opponent uh gets on their toss that's how many coins less they have the next round uh, it, uh, which then leads to a downward spiral basically where if it's a one-on-one -on -one thing the first the person who lands the first blow is going to tend to be the person that wins now you might argue that that's pretty accurate to how fights generally go uh except for very rare hail mary situations where someone manages to pull out a win at the last moment which is still possible with this i mean you could have a couple of times where your character uh rolls max or it gets max successes like two row two turns in a row while your opponent just just doesn't succeed in anything because they get all all tails in their rolls it can happen um it didn't happen in any of my play tests but i really didn't do that many i did like two or three of them so it's it's okay i'm not i'm not necessarily knocking it i think i think it's attritiony but at the same time if you you got a group of adventurers working together then you're fine the the other interesting thing that this system does is it does away with the concept of experience instead character advancement is tracked by fame how famous is your character now it, it assumes that most people are going to be playing knights and that's kind of why it uses fame because a knight is their greatness is judged by how many people know their name how many people recognize their coat of arms and it really plays into the prince valiant themes of honor and and fame and you know being the best knight possible being chivalrous it really plays into that and i think that that's great it's a it's a and a great example of form following function and function function following form um where it falls down a little bit is when you start adding in like people that want to play a townsperson or people that want to play a nun or someone that wants to play a a merchant someone who wants to play a bard or a thief or a rogue or whatever uh, you can do all those things they're all part of the rules but they they calculate fate fame differently and they have different totals that they need to follow and uh they need different amounts in order to get to the next level in the game because it kind of uses levels um that can get a bit wonky if you're if you're like me and you've been in dnd dnd long enough you're used to the idea of different classes having different 
levels of experience points to earn in order to go up, go up a level. So it's not too different from that. It's it's really easy to to work with. But if you're new to that, then it's going to be a bit jarring. Um, I want to give you a heads up of what you're looking at. So fame is cool. I like it as a concept. And the other thing that it does, and this is the most interesting part, is it emphasizes itself as a storytelling game by encouraging all of the players to take a turn as the storyteller. So what it does is it says that each group should have an overall grand storyteller or the main storyteller. This is in in most gaming terms, this is the game master. This is the person that sets up the overarching plots. And then each session, one of the players can be the storyteller for that session. So let's say the grand storyteller runs the first session of the game. They run the one that sets up the action. And then next, uh, the next game session, player A is the storyteller. And their character is not involved or, or whatever the group decides happens to characters when they're, when the player is the storyteller. Um, and so they run that session. They run their scenario, whatever they've cooked up. And it might just be a single encounter with one knight on the road, or it might be a, a slightly more involved thing that could take two or three sessions to resolve. That's, that's fine. Whatever, they have cooked up with the master storyteller, with the, the head storyteller, um, they can run. And when they're done, they pass the baton to the next player who is going to run the next session and create their own story. And this, this creates this, and, and this continues until everyone has taken a turn as the storyteller. Everyone is taking a turn and then it goes back to the the main storyteller and they get a chance to kind of wrap it all together in, in a bow or establish the next arc of whatever it is happening. This is great for groups that really like um, if you're the forever DM and you never get to play. Uh, you're going to like this because you can be the main storyteller. And you start the whole thing out, but then you can pass the baton as often as you want to someone else and then have your character ready. And while they're running, you're playing, but you're still the game master. So they don't have to be panicked about running a whole campaign. They just have to worry about running one encounter. And then they pass the baton back to you and your character fades back into the background and you go on about your day, um, but you still get a chance to play it. And that's not something that I like about this. Now, they also have rewards for this. So for every time a storyteller who isn't the main storyteller uh, plays a session, they get a, they can get a, a certificate. Um, and that certificate also gives them the right to have a special ability. Now, this can be defined by the main storyteller or it can be something that this main storyteller lets them pick. That's kind of up to the main storyteller. Uh, and they can then use that certificate as a player. They can turn it in in order to cause a special event to take place, whether that is like I'm going to, like my storyteller, uh, after I ran my session, gave me this sheet of paper and said that I get, uh, what's there's a special ability. I'm going to try to look it up real quick. Um, this circumstance. Uh, you know what? It's not it's not jumping out at me, so let's just go to the back and I'll leave. All right. I pick terrify, or they picked terrify for me. So then uh my characters, my character and the rest of the group are in this scenario where we're at a we're fighting are maneuvering around a army of invading, you know, barbarians, if you, for lack of a better term, or, uh, you know, barbar uh, Celts. A group of Celts are trying to get into, uh, trying to come over Hadrian's Wall and invade King, the land of King Arthur. And we need to stop them at the wall. On my turn, 
I can then say, I'm going to terrify them. And I spend my certificate. And as long as the storyteller is okay with it, because they do get, they do kind of get a certain amount of veto power, but really they're encouraged to accept every certificate as long as, it, as long as it's being used in good faith. Um, I can terrify them. Now I have to t describe how, uh, maybe, you know, I, I, there, I, it may, I have this special battle horn that I've had forever, uh, as part of my equipment and I blow on it and that sound reverberates, uh, off of the hills and it terrifies the, the opponents and they, they react according to the terrifiability. And that's great. And it's spent and it's gone. And then the next time I'm a storyteller, I can earn a different one. And each of the other players has theirs that they've earned. And that's a neat idea. It's an idea that I kind of want to incorporate into other games, or at least kind of kind of lead out, lead into, because it it encourages players who are interested in DMing but are a little scared to, you know, to put their foot all the way in. It encourages them to dip their toe and get something for it. They get a reward that they can use. So it's, a, it's an aspect of this system that I have not encountered anywhere else. I've seen games that encourage players to you know, run a scene. The, the Rune role-playing game that was based on the video game by the same name did the same thing. But it didn't have a reward system for it. It just had this happens. Uh, Prince Valiant storytelling game gives you a reward for it. So that's really cool. Well, that's enough about the system. Let's talk about the book. The book is well laid out. It's clear. It's clean. It's crisp. It's not concise. Uh, there's a lot of words in here. The rule system. I was able to translate all the rules in this game into a Word document. And it was less than 10 pages long. These books are over 100 pages long. In fact, uh, let's look real quick. We're looking at 108 pages. It was almost on the point. All right. And almost all of that is setting and story information. It's the Prince Valiant setting. It's a little bit about the different NPCs that you will encounter in the Prince Valiant setting. And it's telling you how to run the game, how to play it. There's a lot of information on how to play a Prince Valiant themed role playing game in here. Hence the name. Uh, but I like it. I find it fun. I find it engaging. It's one of the few rule books that I've really enjoyed reading cover to cover because the information is solid. I don't always agree with some of the information because they they have it's it's a product of the time that it was written in role playing game stuff and it tries to be quasi historical and talk about well you know one of the things it mentions is female adventurers and what they couldn't couldn't do honestly I've read enough of Prince Valiant to know that uh, it was a bit conservative at times but it also was a place where uh, you know female characters were complete. It could also be complete, for lack of a better term, badasses. They could be all. They could be amazing. So as far as I'm concerned, the canon didn't quite follow this either, and I can throw it out the window and not care. Uh, and you can too. Don't let anything in this book, anything that's setting wise, alarm you or make you upset because you can toss it out. And frankly, if if there's too much and you just don't want to play the game anymore, you're fine with you're fine with me. I'm not offended. You know, obviously I'm recommending it because I think it's cool, but I recognize that it's also a very dated piece. Uh, if you're not cool with that, there's other games. It's OK. Don't worry about it. Don't stress. Um, but enough of that character sheet. There's your character sheet right there. Not quite fitting on a note card, but uh, you can get all that on a single piece of paper. And it's 
easy to follow. It's easy to read. The one thing that I will note for most people, this would be a big surprise, is there's no magic. It's not that magic doesn't exist. In the Prince Valiant world, there are things like, you know, the singing sword, which is Prince Valiant's sword. There's Excalibur. Magic exists. But it's not something that the players use. It's something that is in the hands of these very powerful magic items that are in the hands of the big, big darn heroes, the big darn villains, and Merlin. Um, you're not going to play a wizard in this game. You're going to play a knight. You're going to play a rogue. You're going to, you could play a charlatan who pretends to be a wizard and uses their cunning and guile in order to trick people into thinking that they're a wizard you can totally play that it actually has rules to cover that you're good um but you're not going to be throwing around a fireball that just doesn't happen so if that's your jam this system's not for you i understand um and i hope you do too all right that's, you know, it's kind of it. There's, I mean, if you're into Prince Valiant, this is really neat. If you're into a low impact uh, medieval game, then this is the game for you. It's pretty, it's, it's simple to, to teach. It's easy to play. I've had fun with it. I intend to continue having fun with it. I might run a solo session for this channel using this system because it's entertaining to me and there's lots of fun for it to, to have with it um but it's out of print it's hard to find now okay the visual impairment aspect of things so i showed you pages let's talk about that real quick the font size is not too bad you are uh, most people are going to be able to read this without too much trouble there's um some of the text is blue some of the lines are red and that might be an issue for some people it might not you you be the judge you know what you need you know what you don't none of the not much of the text come itself is red so you shouldn't have issues there that shouldn't be a problem <coughs> except for some titles i take that back some of the the, the section titles are in red ink so that might be a problem for some people all right, the art never interrupts the text. There is never any art with a behind the text you need to be able to read. Now, there might be panels, because a lot of the art is taken from panels of Prince Valiant. That might be hard for people to read, but uh, the actual rules of the game are never hidden behind that stuff. So that's easy to... I'll, I'll show another page, give you an idea. That's another picture. It's always... All the art is contained in boxes. And so you got the, the rest of the text beneath it. Easy to understand. If uh, that, what I just showed you is the old, that's the, the old, uh, sorry, the new books. If you think that that text might be too light, uh, the type set might not be bold enough for you, then the old book, the layout is much the same but for the most part, the ink is a lot darker. The ink is what I would consider bold. And I think it is actually slightly larger too. So given that there's not much difference uh, content-wise between the old printing and the new printing, you would do just fine with this old book if, that's, uh, if, if that is your concern, if you really want something to... Uh, that's easier to read and it's they're hardback sorry they're paperbacks and so you can you know take them in places where you don't want to take a hardback i prefer the hardback because i like the full color but that's me i also have a couple of copies of the softback the old version so as far as uh as far as the ability to read you're you're covered there's no PDF of this. I have tried to find one um, legally. A legal, I've tried to find a legal PDF, and I can't. So unfortunately, 
if you're relying on a screen reader, this one is not going to be for you. I'm sorry. Um, hopefully, the company that was producing this will get the license back soon and they can make more. Because I think if they get that license back, then they can start, they, they can, you know, produce a PDF of this and sell it on drive through or some other PDF company. They'll make money because this is a great game and people like me that are familiar with it are going to flog it to the end and back. But um, I would love to have a PDF of this because I'd make it a lot easier to uh, run on my computer. So, but it doesn't exist right now. It's, not, it's just not there. We're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wishing. I'm, I'm throwing wish. I'm throwing pennies out there. Someone listen. So, that's Greg Stafford's Prince Valiant storytelling game. It's really fun. It's pretty easy to learn. There's a lot of meat to the story and the setting not to the system. The system is pretty straightforward. The other thing that the system does, which I haven't mentioned, is the system puts equal weight on physical combat and social combat or social interaction. So it doesn't have exhaustive combat systems and then no social stuff. It, it, there's equal weight in how the rules work. It works the same whether you are trying to verbally spar with somebody in the court of King Arthur to prevent them from sending your relative off on a one-way mission as you would be fighting against a peasant rebellion. Same, The same amount of rules are involved in all of this. So if you are the kind of group that wants a social game but still wants to play in a medieval setting, this has got you covered. If you want to do grim, dark Game of Thrones kind of political maneuvering, actually, and you're okay with not having really announced rules and just having a basic set of rules to cover things because you really just want to be able to play the game and let the rules get out of the way, this will also cover you. You're going to have to do a lot more work or not. Maybe you just pick Camelot as your setting and then get go full you know, grim and gritty on Camelot. You can do that. Like, you know, I salute you. I, I would love to do that too. Uh, this game will cover you for that. Um, so that is Prince Valiant, the storytelling game. There's a lot of extra scenarios in this book. If you happen to get your hands on this one, highly worth it. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I wish you all best of luck and best of days. Peace be with you. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Maybe leave a comment. Tell me what was good. Tell me what was bad. Uh, tell me I need to improve. That's fine. Just let me know. And if you do want to see a solo session or two of this game, let me know. And I'll make one because I'd like to make one. But at the same time, I'm not sure if I really want to because it's out of print. And I think that might confuse people. But then again, there's not a lot of stuff for it out there on YouTube. So here it is. Uh, it's your opportunity. Let me know what you would like. Hope you have a good day again. Thank you. Peace be with you. Bye bye.